you know, maybe I'll start really quickly and say, what are we talking about when we say supply chain logistics? And it is the ancient art of getting X to Y. Um, you know, when we say an ancient art, we really mean it. You know, it's basically a 3,000 year old industry that started the first time someone loaded items up into a cart and then tried to bring that to market. Over the past 3,000 years, amazingly, not much has changed other than the mode of transportation. You fast forward a couple thousand years and supply chains went to the seas. And for the first time, it went from local and regional supply chains to global supply chains. Fast forward another thousand years and things didn't change much. Uh, the boats got a little faster, global trade routes developed a bit, um, and we started to see kind of the interconnection that we're used to seeing today. It wasn't until the mid 1800s with the advent of the steamship that modern supply chains really started to develop. And since then, it's really just been an ever increasing rate of new modes of transportation. So now in addition to the, chi the ship, we live in the world of planes, trains, automobiles, and everything in between, you know, getting things from X to Y. Amazingly, it wasn't actually until the 1950s that the largest innovation in the supply chain space occurred, and that was the development of the notion of containerization. So instead of loading thousands of oddly shaped items into the hull of a ship or a plane, the concept was develop standardized containers that dramatically increase the efficiency at which goods can go from X to Y. The first container ship did its maiden voyage in 1957 from Newark to Houston with 58 containers on board. What was so amazing uh, was not the number of containers, but was the unit economics that resulted from this. So the Ideal X, the first container ship, was able to load um, shipping tonnage at 16 cents a ton compared to $5.83 a ton from the prior methodology. Not surprisingly, productivity went through the roof a 17x increase with containerization. So now a team could load 30 tons of goods in an hour as opposed to 1.7. The effect of these fundamental changes in unit economics created the modern port that we know today that now is all over the world connecting billions of consumers. You know, it would take another 100 years or so until the next major innovation in supply chain happened. In the 1960s, we had you know, the advent of a new business model introduced by an enterprising young Yale, law, or Yale business student. Um, and he got the very predictable response from a business school professor. In order, to earn an, in order to earn better than a C, an idea must be feasible. Does anyone have a guess as to who this entrepreneur was? Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx. And you know, I think Fred learned himself that building a supply chain and logistics empire is a hard job. A couple years in, he got down to $5,000 left for the company, couldn't fuel the FedEx planes the next day, so he did what we all would do, went to Vegas, hit the blackjack tables, and turned $5,000 into $27,000. FedEx planes flew on Monday, you know, the rest is history, and we really learned that if you want to build a supply chain empire, you have to do whatever it takes. Today, FedEx is a $40 billion market cap company, and while we're, we have, you know, companies to look at like this, Despite all these changes, we go back to the thesis that things really haven't changed that much. Slightly newer cars, better planes, larger ships, certainly, but not that big of a change in the end of the day. Today, we think that's different. The evolution of consumer attitudes combined with new technologies are creating an inflection point in supply chain logistics. And we think there are a couple gravitational shifts that are occurring right now that are gonna drive the next generation of supply chain and logistics innovation. I'm gonna take two, three minutes and just highlight a couple of those shifts. The first is just growth. It's pretty straightforward. From 2015 to 2021, total container and global shipping volumes going up about 33%. If we extend that out to 2030, it goes up another 33%. So we're talking about really doubling the entire volume of global trade in a 15 year period. The tools, the infrastructure, the business models, the technology that we have today does, is not ready for this increasing volume. The second major shift is green. You know, it probably comes as no surprise that more and more businesses, consumers, and everything in between are focused on the sustainability of their footprint and of their activities. Shouldn't be surprising that 90% of CEOs surveyed, 88% of business school students believe that sustainability is key to business success. What's even more interesting is that about 66% of consumers, and this isn't millennials, this is all consumers, say that they would be willing to pay more for a product if they knew it came from a sustainable brand. So if you're going after sustainability, where would you begin? This may shock you, but a supply chain is actually 80% of the average company's greenhouse gas emission footprint. 
So if you take their entire core operations, you multiply it by four, and that's actually the impact of their supply chain. So if you're searching for sustainability outcomes, you would definitely start in the supply chain. The third and final gravitational shift is what we call the experience economy. And this may be the largest and most impactful of all of them. We're dealing with a new world of consumers, millennials and beyond, that have new expectations. Items personalized on demand for everything. That's from transportation, to food, to shopping and commerce. They even expect media and entertainment instantly on demand. It should come as no surprise that this is having a major impact on the supply chain and logistics industry as it is fighting to keep pace with these consumer demands. Since 2015 by itself, the average click to, sh to front door time period for Amazon has gone from five to three and a half days. Not surprisingly, every other merchant is constantly chasing and fighting to keep up. Today, Amazon's built a nearly trillion dollar company being the most sophisticated supply chain logistics business in the world. And they're not stopping there. With the recent announcement of one day shipping for free as part of all Prime memberships, they're creating a new normal. Um, when we talk to some of our partners in the space, they expect same day shipping to become the new normal. And so Amazon is pushing forward with kind of these new expectations of timeliness and speed, and the entire supply chain and logistics industry is trying to keep pace. It comes as no surprise that RBC thinks that one day shipping is a $24 billion a year revenue opportunity for Amazon. That's 10% of their entire revenue base. And that's because supply chain in the end of the day really does drive consumer experience and consumer value. And how are they getting there? Not just with us. Over 200,000 robots now operate in Amazon warehouses. And everyone presumes the value of this is replacing the cost of human labor. But what's so interesting is that the real value is about space and efficiency. An Amazon robot-driven warehouse, which has twice as many robots as people, is 20% smaller and holds 50% more inventory than the standard Amazon warehouse. So as they start putting up micro-fulfillment in New York, in Mexico City, in London, in Beijing, these types of highly efficient infrastructure are going to be mission critical. But it's not just the warehouse. Last year, Chinese firms bought about 90,000 industrial robots. Next year, it'll be 175,000. So end to end, we imagine that there are going to be millions of warehouse workers, supply chain workers, whose livelihood is being disrupted with automation. So when we think about what is the future of supply chain and logistics, we have two overwhelming forces. We have constantly evolving consumer demands and expectations with ever evolving technology. And we think at the intersection of those two things, we're gonna see breakthrough innovation. So the purpose of today is to identify, discuss, explore some of these themes and topics that we think are really gonna define the breakthrough innovation of supply chain and logistics over the next decade. Thank you so much for your time, and it's my pleasure to introduce Tara Lookabout from the GSV Labs team. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Let's try it again. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I have a tough stage to follow. Um, that was a great presentation uh, from Alec about kind of what our perspective is on supply chain and logistics as an industry, where technology is taking it. I want to change the conversation a little bit and dive into how supply chain and logistics is benefiting the world for good. Um, and so to join me today, I have Veronica Juarez from Lyft. Um, she leads their social enterprise business, um, and she'll be um, talking a bit about what they're doing um, to support the greater good um, in the world um, and, and how technology um, is uh, in the supply chain logistics space um, kind of contributing to that mission. So um, Veronica, I'd like to pass it to you to introduce yourself and share some of your background. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for spending some of your time with me. I wanted to share just a little bit about my story. It's always kind of strange when you're up here on stage and um, feels like we can be strangers, but I want to get a little more related. So I grew up in Houston, Texas. Um, I am a fifth generation Mexican-American and first in my family to go to college. Uh, I grew up in a family that really believed in political activism and involvement as a way for progress and change. 
So I grew up stuffing envelopes and, and block walking with my aunts and uncles. Um, my uncles were president of the firefighters union and my aunt ran for city council and all of my family was just really involved in local politics. So when it came time to go to college and figure out what I was gonna study, I went to Stanford and um, I studied issues of social justice and racial equity. So I looked at systems for change, access, opportunity, a lot of work in the education space, uh, the foster care industry. And after college, then spent about a decade in public service. And I always knew I probably would because it was, um, it was uh, kind of implied by my family <laughs> that, <laughs> that we had to be involved. Um, so I worked for 10 years uh, at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, state and local, I spent in Texas, I went back home. And uh, Tara and I were just talking about this. She said, how did you transition from government to tech? And you know, 10 years in public service, it was like blood, sweat, and tears. And at that point, I was really interested in moving to the private sector, but I wanted to choose a company whose mission and vision and values I could really get behind. And I just started looking online and I found Lyft. And at the time we were in three cities um, and I had no idea what Lyft was, but the job description of starting their government relations team just really spoke to me. And it's a be an innovator and like work in tech and change the world. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, what is this Lyft? And uh, <laughs> so I called my friends, they're like, oh, it's great. It's this ride sharing app and you just, you know, use your phone. Um, and so I decided like, okay, this is my job. Um, and I made it my mission to get this job. Um, and so that's how it really happened. I mean, what was, what was interesting that I didn't realize at the time, and none of us did actually, is that transportation is regulated at the state and local level. So the fact that I had spent the majority of my professional career to date working in state and local politics um, really positioned me well to build our government relations team structure and effort from scratch um, for about two years. So that's how I ended up at Lyft. And one other story, just because Tara and I were talking about it. Um, you know, it was a real culture shock for me to enter tech. I had no idea what I was getting into. And my co-founder later told me, he's like, I was really worried about you. Those first two weeks, you were walking around like a deer in the headlights. Um, I was like, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what to wear. Like, why didn't we have phones on our desk? You know, why were we sharing two bathrooms with 100 people in a garage? It was just like, it, it, was, it was so much, but... Um, I quickly got my sea legs. Kind of building off of that a bit, because I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but we often say, um, you know, there's a pain point in this organization or in this enterprise. There's a startup with a seemingly perfect solution, um, but ultimately, um, you know, d no deal is done because we see that, um, you know, one side of the, the spectrum, the, the big enterprise is speaking a different language from, from the early stage startup. And um, we see that a lot in, in government work as well. So how would you, you know, frame for an early stage company how to approach these conversations with government and enterprise um, teams in an effective, clear, communicative way? Definitely. Um, so I, I think, I mean, the best advice I could give is to hire somebody with that unique experience. It's really difficult, I think, to, uh, to appreciate what somebody's life is like as a public servant or a staffer or a regulator, unless you've done the day-to-day, -day, unless you have seen how unglamorous it is, unless you understand like what it's like to answer phones all day long about angry constituents who can't access the services that you're, you're trying to provide. So, you know, when I started our team, um, I really went into meetings across the country as a peer. You know, I sat at tables with policymakers and regulators as their peer, understanding like, yes, I know, I, I know what your life is like, and I and I know the kind of problems that you are faced to solve. I also know that transportation is a major pain point for access for your constituents, and you have only a few options. Like, you can invest in hundreds of millions of dollars of projects to um, build new infrastructure, or you could work with somebody like Lyft and help us you know, solve those transportation issues for you. So that made all the difference, I think, in us being able to create a conversation where 
folks felt like, and still do, like we're their partners and not, um, not a you know, scary tech company that doesn't understand what they're what they have to manage every day. So we're here at a supply chain and logistics conference talking about social enterprise. Um, how do you think um, large organizations or or how can we start having this conversation now about embedding social enterprise um, as a as a fundamental um, need for your organization early on? Why should we do that and how, how can we start doing that? Um, how can we communicate and, c and encourage folks to, to embed social impact goals into their, their bottom line? Great question. So, um, you know, I believe that you have to fundamentally believe that doing good is, is going to be good for your business. And the studies show it. You know, they show that if you are a mission-driven company, if you lead with values, um, that you will make more money, that you will attract more employees, and that you'll have uh, lower turnover rates for those employees. That's certainly true for Lyft. Um, we know that 95% of employees come to Lyft and stay at Lyft because of the mission, and because they feel like a personal connection to the impact that we're having on the world. So I think it's important, you know, especially if you're a founder or you're part of an exec team, to really ask yourself, do I believe that? Do I believe that committing myself to social impact is going to drive our business? And if that's the case, then everything else will come. Mm -hmm. um, because you'll continue to make decisions standing inside of that commitment. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what you've built at Lyft and how you're um, you know, leveraging the logistics platform that Lyft has built um, for social impact? So um, I had to pick my title uh, when I started building this business. They were like, yeah, you can build it. Like, what are you going to call yourself? And so I started researching. Um, this was over a year ago. And I love social enterprise because it means business for good. Um, so I'm building our business for nonprofits and social services, which means I'm really focused on how can we provide rides to low income and vulnerable communities. Now. The interesting thing about tech and access to tech is you really, you need a lot to be able to access it that, you know, that we don't always appreciate. So if you want to order a Lyft, you need a smartphone. You need to know how to use the tech. You need to have the language accessibility um, in the language that the app is offered. You need to have a credit card. And you need to have money on that credit card to authorize a ride. So if you don't have any of those, if you don't have all of those things, then you can't get a lift the way that you and I would get a lift. And one of the platforms that we developed um, is called our concierge or dispatch system. And it allows an administrator from a computer or now their phone to dispatch a lift on behalf of somebody else and receive it in real time or pre-schedule that lift for them. So all of a sudden we were able to cut through um, all of those other barriers for accessing rides. And what we found is that it was the cornerstone for quite a large and burgeoning uh, healthcare vertical that we have built. When we were looking at, you know, I've been <laughs> studying, um, and I'm by no means an expert, but I've been studying impact investing for years. Because for us, you know, to be able to provide a ride means that we have to pay for that ride, right? It's not just a software. We have to pay at least 80% to a driver. We have to pay our overhead costs. We have to pay insurance, background checks. Then we have to pay our staff. So building this program for scale was never going to be free. I had to find it. I had to figure out how do we actually come up with the money to pay for this program. And, you know, our, the success in our healthcare vertical really proved to many of us, oh, we can now use this technology for other vulnerable communities at scale. And so I'll just, I'll give you um, uh, a great example of, of one of our partners, uh, one of my clients. Uh, we were kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, but Be The Match, the National Marrow Donor Program, is um, one of my largest partners. And if, is anyone familiar with Be The Match? So if you need a bone marrow transplant in this country, they are the only organization that exists to support you. They receive 16,000 requests for um, bone marrow transplants a year, and they're only able to fulfill about 10,000 of them. Um, they depend on volunteers to pick up 
the bone marrow that you need for a transplant and deliver it in real time to the client that needs it. And before us, they really didn't have a great way of doing it. Um, they would depend on, they just kind of had to try to make it work, but they didn't have a great system for doing it. So now those volunteers use Lyft um, to transport that bone marrow in real time. Their donors also use Lyft for them to transport um, their donors to and from the hospitals. Their volunteers, um, uh, their recipients, excuse me, also now use Lyft, um, and their employees are now using Lyft as well. So we've really transformed the way that they are able to move their people around um, to deliver these life-saving, you know, this life-saving matter in real time. Thanks. And so you kind of touched on it a bit on the, the impact investing piece, but um, for organizations that are thinking about implementing social enterprise into their business, um, what are some standards or benchmarking that they can look to, besides, besides profit, of course, since um, that's not the ultimate goal, um, but where can they look for, for guidance? Um, so, you know, I, it takes a long, I'm going to be honest, it takes a really long time to have um, success with nonprofit organizations and uh, government procurement sales cycles. It's, it's just a long, long deal. And longer than I thought it would be. Um, so I think one of the most important pieces for us is that we had proven that these products could generate revenue in other ways. That was like table stakes, right? That we didn't just experiment with, um, with a social enterprise uh, um, piece, but we really looked at, okay, is this, is this business going to generate sustainable revenue for us. So that was um, that was really key for us to take the jump and say, okay, now let's experiment with something that's going to be a little riskier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's interesting that you, you brought up the sales cycle um, because I think um, a lot of, of early stage companies maybe approach um, a little naively um, the concept of working with, with local governments. And um, aside from that, what do you think is a common misconception that, that folks um, enter into the social enterprise um, world with? I think the biggest misconception is that you can't make money. Um, and so I can't share with you numbers of what our business, what this particular business is generating now because we haven't ever shared those publicly, I asked today. Um, but it's meaningful, you know? It's, it's a meaningful and significant line of business that is growing and that we will now continue to invest in. So I, I think that's, that's the biggest piece, that doing good doesn't have to be separate from being profitable. You can really do both at once. Mm -hmm. um, one program I'll also share with you, so, you know, we wanna be everyone's em employee, um, provider of choice. So if you're at a company and you're traveling for work, we would love for you to use Lyft. And if you're not already doing it and you would like to get inside a contract, please get in touch with us. One of the things that we have launched with our standard employee travel program um, is our Lyft One program, which is a program that uh, I developed a couple years ago. So we will take 1% of a company's aggregate employee travel spend with us and donate it to our Wheels for All program. And Wheels for All is our discounted and donated uh, transportation program. So we will then deploy that money for rides for uh, low income and vulnerable communities. So that's just another way of like, hey, how can you embed and you know bring that commitment to social impact into your larger, mm -hmm. uh, much more sustainable business model? Yeah. Something we were, we were chatting around about backstage as well was um, the public perception and the, the impact that, that Lyft has made um, in the public eye, um, and um, you know how Lyft is a, a trustworthy brand and, and one that people look to as sort of a, um, a, a best practices organization. Um, how do you think that the Lyft social enterprise business has contributed to that mentality, and, and how have you seen kind of customer um, sentiment towards, towards Lyft evolve over the past few years? Sure. Um, so, so, so the business I am leading is really a product and offshoot of our company's continuous commitment to communities and to impact and to 
standing for something that we can believe in. If you all are remember or use Lyft back in the day, you remember pink mustaches <laughs> and fist bumps and the fact that we encouraged everyone to sit in the front seat mm -hmm. um, and to create a community and like a dialogue with your driver um, that we are all interconnected in this way. Mm -hmm. And that has since evolved. You know, when we went public in our public offering document, uh, we put a stake in the ground and said, this is not just something we talk about, but we will now donate either $50 million annually or 1% of our profits, whatever is greater, to our Lyft City Works initiatives. And that's, that initiative is, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> that initiative is um, to invest in the communities that we operate in, in three different areas. So discounted or donated transportation, uh, transportation infrastructure, which really speaks to our bikes and scooters and multimodal programs. And third, investment in our clean energy initiatives. Um, so we're not shying away from the fact that this is really important to who we are and what we do. You know, we're, we're doubling down on that commitment. Mm -hmm. We have a couple minutes left and I wanna open it up to audience questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and someone will come by with a microphone. Um, so anybody have a question for Veronica? Right there. <laughs> um, you have this universe of drivers that are part of the gig economy, and some of them are marginalized and living paycheck to paycheck. So I'm wondering if that falls in your purview and what initiatives you have in place to help them from a social enterprise perspective and, and how you think about and prioritize those in terms of obvious you know, corporate metrics around profitability with respect to, say, driver retention uh, versus other harder to measure initiatives that might help those drivers. For sure. So, um, I'm sorry, what is your name and, and where, where do you- Adam Taub, Stan Capital. Awesome. So, uh, to answer your question, no, that doesn't fall under my purview, but I can certainly say a few things about it. Uh, you know, the investment in the gig economy has provided a lot of flexibility for workers, right? For millions of people across America. And it is changing the way that people work. And we also, as a country, do not have all the systems currently set up to support this third way in this gig economy of working. So for years and continually, we work really closely with policymakers and regulators to develop innovative ways to support our driver community, which is at the heart of everything we do. Um, and still allow for the gig economy to flourish. And I'll, and I'll just say personally, and I mentioned this at the beginning, I grew up in a union family, right? With My dad has always been active. He's still active in the plumbers union in Houston. And so growing up in a union family and then advocating for a gig economy company was is, you know, quite a, quite, it, it shows how much we have evolved as a country in terms of the way we're working. Um, but that doesn't change our commitment to drivers and our, and our commitment to support them. And one, one point I will add to that is that we were the first company in this industry for years that allowed consumers to tip to drivers. And to date, drivers have earned over a billion dollars in tips uh, through their ability to do that through our program. Fantastic. Um, I think we have time for one one more question. Um, Alec, if we could get the mic. Oh. Bobby Jones, JCG Management. Um, cannabis, it's legal. Uh, a lot of people are in pain. What is uh, the social impact to deliver uh, cannabis products to people in pain who can't get out of the home? Are you guys doing any work in that space? So all of our rides require that uh, somebody be in the car. So currently, the vast majority of all the programs in our core business products require that somebody is actually in the vehicle. So the uh, bone marrow example that I gave earlier means that somebody has to be in the car with that bone marrow transplant. Um, another example of, and this is somewhat related to patient healthcare, 
uh, is, you know, I've started speaking to the Red Cross, and they really need help with uh, blood delivery for blood donations, and they're interested in using lifts, which we're happy to pilot them with, pilot that with them as long as somebody is in the vehicle uh, with that sample. Awesome, thank you guys so much, and thank you, Veronica, for joining us and for providing all of the insight. So thank you again, Tara and Veronica. It was a really interesting initial conversation as to how supply chain drives something other than profit and how people are starting to think about this new logistics infrastructure to drive social outcomes, community outcomes. Uh, but now I have the real opportunity to invite up to the stage Jack Paley, who's one of our enterprise innovation managers, to lead a conversation around the future of mobility and how things are going to continue to get from X to Y. Hello, hello. We might need some chairs up here. Um, while we're waiting, if anybody over in the back would like to filter in, we have some open seats over here. No pressure, but if you'd like. I just wanted to thank one more time Veronica and Tara for the questions and insights that they shared. It's uh, really an honor to have these types of speakers come and join us tonight and share their perspectives on both social impact and the supply chain and logistics industry. So thank you one more time. Um, yeah, please, please, absolutely. They deserve every bit of that. Um, really amazing what they've done in their careers. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage four amazing panelists, uh, very different backgrounds, but I believe we're gonna have a very insightful conversation. So please help me welcome Lydia Yan, Kofi Asante, Matthew Hall, and Jonah Houston. All right, one more time. Thank you everybody for coming to the stage and thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. So I wanna kick off in a very low friction way by allowing our panelists tonight to share a little bit about themselves. So if each one of you, starting with Lydia, wouldn't mind just sharing for about a minute a little bit about your background and what brought you to the supply chain logistics industry. Well, hi everyone, my name is Lydia Yin. I am the CEO and co-founder of Next Trucking. Uh, we call ourselves the first trucker-centric marketplace where we connect shippers with small trucking companies. Um, my background is really e-commerce. Um, I worked at the $2 billion e-commerce company for a couple of years as their marketing executive, managing about $20 million marketing budget. The reason why I got into logistics is really because my family, my family have a 3PL company from California, and we operate a few warehouses. And then we service a lot of uh, um, imported goods providers, uh, freight forwarders, 3PL companies, and the partners overseas. So um, I was never interested in logistics. So like any other girl, I like fashion, I like marketing, um, I like social media. Um, but really I got into it is one day I went to uh, the family office and I saw one truck driver literally spent three hours in our warehouse looking for a container. And uh, that truck driver is from a huge trucking company. And he came in with a piece of paper with container numbers jotted down on that piece of paper. And uh, we took three hours looking for that container, couldn't find it. And at the end, we found that he put the wrong number on it because he got the call from his dispatcher, he wrote it down on a piece of paper. 
So then we were like, we have to do something for this industry. This is too backward, and it's a huge opportunity. Then we brainstormed, came up with Next Trucking, a really trucker-centric marketplace to build softwares to empower truck drivers. Thank you. Awesome. Um, how's everybody doing? Good? Ooh. Awesome, awesome. My name's Kofi. I'm the head of strategy and business development at Elroy Air. Uh, we're building an autonomous, large-scale, about 1,200-pound, drone that can deliver 300 pounds of cargo over 300 mile range. What got me into logistics really started off uh, when I had an opportunity to join Uber at a time that was uh, pretty challenging for them, but that ended up essentially turning into the next chapter of what they're focused on. At the time, uh, Uber had been really hyper-focused on rides but we had an opportunity to think about something new, an entirely new market, new set of drivers that fundamentally had been ignored by technology. Uh, and so at that time, we were all in a warehouse. Uh, they had acquired Auto, which is an autonomous trucking company at the time. I joined them at that period of time for us to think about jumping into building what we then called Uber Freight. Uh, Uber Freight grew pretty drastically in the course of the last few years. Uh, from there, I uh, also had a similar experience where as we were talking with more of the drivers, we would see that some of the, some of the drivers would be sitting at warehouses and facilities for hours on end. Understanding that truck driving employs more than three and a half million people all around the US, we realized pretty quickly that if we can solve this problem for one of the drivers, we're really tapping into a pretty special market that we can help out a good amount of families and people who are working hard to get us the things that we need. So at that time, uh, the main problem that I was hyper-focused on was thinking about how do we fundamentally increase the utilization of our drivers. At the time, something had come into play called the ELD mandate, which had limited essentially the hours of service that a truck driver could operate. So even if you're at a facility and it's not your fault, you would have to go home with less pay that day. Uh, so it created something that I called Power Loop, which essentially allows for a shared group of trailers to be loaded ahead of time, and then any truck driver to essentially be able to loop to their next load with their power unit. This essentially creates like a jump bike type of, or if you see the scooters around the, the area, for truck drivers so they can continue to stay on the road and also get round trips. Uh, so after building that up for a while, um, I got grabbed over by Elroy Air, where we are now thinking about trying to solve a whole new set of problems. Right now, um, one of the speakers mentioned that same day shipping is something that is becoming a core component for parcel delivery. We all benefit from it in urban environments, but over one billion people around the world are outside of the way of strong roadways. So we were thinking if the demand for urgent logistics is growing, but infrastructure is fundamentally staying the same and not trending, we need to be able to decouple the two. Uh, so we built a very, very large scale drone that will enable a new modality different than just ground or airports with planes. Uh, and we've been able to start flight tests as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm thinking about what markets, what regions we're gonna be going to so that we can continue to connect communities that are disconnected by that stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Kofi. Very cool. Uh, so I'm Matthew Hall. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Peloton. Uh, not the bike company, but the trucking company. Uh, no discounts for you. <laughs> no, no discounts on, on, on the bikes. Uh, we, we're actually at the auto vehicle automation space. Um, we work with Class 8 trucks, and we're solving a pretty substantial problem. We met, uh, Kofi mentioned ELD and hours of service, and there's obviously a huge driver shortage out there, which I think everybody's aware of, and the aging population of drivers. And there are a number of different challenges right now in the industry. And our technology is designed to solve a lot of those problems, but uh, primarily the most interesting one is, is bringing automation in a real commercial context to the Class 8 space. 
uh, so traditional trucking. Uh, similar to Lydia, I grew up never really having any interest in trucking whatsoever. Uh, my past two positions were in the luxury passenger car space. I worked at Porsche, and before that, I was at uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, building products for people that drive fancy cars. So essentially, uh, that's what my background is. Um, but what it really interested me in Peloton when I started evaluating whether I wanted to start this, uh, this position was the fact that we could have a measurable impact on the way that people get their goods and see, uh, see what it is that's in their, in their hands. And there, there is a measurable problem that currently exists in the market and a lot of ways to solve it. And uh, it was an opportunity to become an executive at a company that was solving that ma major challenge. Um, what I didn't realize was exactly how complicated the problem was and how difficult it is to actually solve those problems. And so that ends up being the reason why I stay in the industry, but how I got there was kind of a roundabout way. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jonah Houston. I'm the creative director at Greenfield Labs, which is a, um, a joint project between uh, the Ford Motor Company and I IDEO, the design consultancy. Uh, based here in the Bay Area, I, I think I'm the I'm the sort of the uh, I'm last in the lineup and the and the kind of outlier of the group. Um, I I spend all of my time uh, and all of my career thinking about, um, or at least now thinking about how to help Ford think about what comes next. Um, so we're thinking a lot about systemic solutions to urban congestion. Uh, we we are acknowledging that um, uh, that the future. Uh, will be very different from the, the current state in terms of how vehicle sales and how OEMs sort of exist in people's lives. The, the current business model of, you know, uh, designing, manufacturing, and selling cars to dealers who sell them to people who put them in their driveways is a declining business. Um, and, and we at Ford want to uh, continue to, to be around for another 116 years. So we're going to, we're thinking hard about uh, not only uh, how delivered goods happen, but also if you, if you sort of abstract that out and think about the impact of autonomous vehicles in terms of just how movement happens in urban spaces, um, there, there is a fair bit of overlap in terms of how we think about what, what's, what's coming uh, and, and what's happening here on this stage. Amazing. Thank you. And truly inspiring, all of you. I, I have to say what you're building is not only great business, but it's helping the supply chain, which is the backbone of how we all get things, how we all live our lives, how we all can build lives around what we're interested in. Something that I want to touch on, because I believe you all kind of briefly mentioned it, was the supply chain logistics industry is traditionally low tech in a lot of ways. And we're at this pivotal point. It's changing a lot. Lydia, in your experience, you said that you were dealing with truckers who were mainly working with physical pieces of paper. and non-organized ways, and now it's moving to digital. Kofi, you were trying to match capacity of drivers who likely were similarly recorded on paper-based systems, and so on and so forth. So what I want to touch on is what challenges have you experienced bringing tech-forward solutions to this industry? And what about customer adoption has been particularly challenging? If you could touch on specifically what you've done or what suggestions you have to create strong customer relationships when you're bringing these tech forward solutions to the market, I think that would be incredibly helpful to the audience and to myself. Well, what challenge is super easy industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's, it were easy, it would be totally different today. And a lot of people would have solved the problems 20 years ago. So let's talk about the trucking industry. Like it, logistics itself is a trillion dollar industry and trucking is a hundred billion dollar industry. It's ginormous and extremely fragmented. And 90% of trucking companies are small ones with less than six trucks, 10 drivers. And then look out of a truck driver is the average age is 51, all right? So they're le less tech savvy. A lot of them are still using CB radios and uh, flip phones. They're not necessarily the most sophisticated group. So on top of that, we're working on drayage. Trucking has like five segments. Drayage is hauling container from the port to a local warehouse, full truck load, LTL, which is less than a truck load. Mm -hmm. Then we have intermodal is hauling container from the train station to a local warehouse and the small parcel. So we're dealing with different trucking companies and it's extremely complex. 
But for next, we focus on poor drainage, which is the most difficult and the most complex sector in trucking. And it's, we call it first mile, mm -hmm. because it, it represents the first mile journey of every single imported good. And this is very difficult because comparing with truckload or LTL that have one or two or three touch points, Drage actually has 17 touch points. There are multiple players in the ecosystems, all the way from steamship lines to terminals to chassis providers, not let alone shippers and carriers and yard providers. So there are a lot of players, and everyone is holding the data to themselves. Nobody is sharing the data. So that's the reason why lack of transparency caused so many issues in drainage. Last year, just LA and Long Beach ports alone, the delay at the ports cost $350 million. There, there are a lot of room for improvement, and those are the problems that we are addressing. So we call ourselves the first trucker central marketplace because we wanted to connect enterprise shippers with small trucking companies, which represent 90% of the industry. And we wanted to build software to empower the smaller guys and put them on our platform, give them software that they couldn't afford in the past, and also empower them to get more loads mm -hmm. and make more turns so they can really make a living not just to survive, but to thrive. So that's what we're focusing on, and it, our strategy is really to empower drivers, which has, actually is our company mission, empower truck drivers and then make freight painless. I love that. Yeah. Jumping off of what Lydia was able to articulate, when we were launching Uber Freight, it started off with a very similar trend, which was if we can make sure that our truck drivers are happy, then our shippers are going to be happy, and then the cycle continues to go. One thing that uh, Jack, you alluded to was you know the challenges that we face in, in that market. We end up being in a situation where uh, sometimes you have this habit or need to feel like you know how to solve the problem off the back. What we did in the earlier stage is we actually switched that narrative. So it was what can we do to listen and better understand what the problem was? And from there, that's where we started to allow our strategy to, to kind of form a little bit more. Jumping over to El Rey Air and thinking about this next wave, which is an entirely new modality. You know, there's trucks, there, there's helicopters, there's planes. This, is, this fits into a new category. What's been really, really helpful is to try and simplify a lot of the complexity for customers, for regulators, for different leaders around the world, we had to tap into the specific thing that they're trying to optimize for. So from a regulatory perspective, we ended up realizing that they're trying to de-risk a lot of their scenarios. So as we're talking with the regulation in the Bahamas or in South Africa or in Australia or any of the other places or Japan, we ended up coming to the conclusion that the all of the other elements of our engineering, of our economics, are not necessarily going to be as relevant as the reliability that we could provide for them. So th being able to do things that focus on the specific type of pain points that they're trying to optimize for ended up helping out a good amount. On the other side, when we're thinking about customers and the respective things that they're trying to optimize for, sometimes we would hear stories about what exists and how we could replace it. I think we tried to strike a nice balance between here's what you're doing currently and this is what we could do better, but then here are the new service opportunities that you haven't thought about. But instead of giving a variety of scenarios, we tried to once again break down the complex problem into something relatively simple, and we said we want to go from point A to point B, and we want to be able to do that effectively. Here's the pricing for that. It would be similar to if you were going to do this with a truck or do this with a helicopter, only we could do it for maybe a better price. From there, then we start to add in more complex variables as going to, to other spots or shifting into it. But the first piece was just making it, chopping the complex problem into something a little bit more simple. Yeah. OK, so first of all, it's really hard to pick one problem and how do you tackle it. It's almost impossible. Uh, similar, similar to what Lydia said. Uh, but 
I would say that one of the biggest things that we look at, uh, that we experienced going into the market, is actually this weird inertia that the trucking industry has for the people that are on the ground actually operating. Uh, so as, as mentioned, it's an older population. It's, uh, it's a more um, reticent to change population. And you know, we're in automation. So when you start to talk to a 55-year-old truck driver who's been doing the same thing for 30 years uh, about uh, automating a vehicle, they start to wonder whether they're going to be replaced, and they start to wonder whether they're going to have to change the way that they do things. And it, it's a very scary conversation for them. Uh, so what we did was we took a we took a very kind of different tact. Instead of saying we're going to uh, reduce the driver in the vehicle or be able to, to to put a vehicle on the road without a driver, what we've actually said is we're going to augment uh, the the driver capability and we're going to make it a pro, almost a skill that that driver can learn to make themselves more valuable in the marketplace. And if you provide them with an opportunity to make more money, they like that. Uh, specifically when they're trying to feed a family or maybe they've got a daughter or a son that's going to college or something along those lines, an uh, additional amount of money is, is great. And to give you a little bit more context, we're not about automating a single vehicle only. We're actually doing what's called automated follow, where the first vehicle has a driver in it and the second vehicle does not. And so what the second vehicle does is effectively follow the first vehicle, which in my view doubles the payload that a single driver can drive. It doesn't reduce the amount of drivers that are needed. So if you go to somebody like a FedEx or a UPS and you say to them, currently you're running 10 loads a day on this particular route, we can actually make that 20 loads a day with the same volume, the same drivers, then that's actually really important to them. That allows them to, to have a different financial picture about how they actually operate. And the inertia that we've seen from the drivers about what we do has decreased as a result of the understanding of those two dynamics. And we're not trying to take them out of the picture. We're actually giving them a skill, and we're actually optimizing for, for the ground and the amount, amount of uh, freight that they can actually move with a single, single vehicle. Um, outside of that, you have to also understand that truck drivers have to deal with people like myself coming in and giving them a project or, or, or a different piece of technology all the time. They have to look at uh, different ways to communicate. They have to do with ELD. They have to look at screens. And a lot of, a lot of these companies are just packing the, the cab full of, of things, and the real estate in the cab is, is shrinking quite a bit. And so if you start to you know, kind of overload their minds with things that they have to do and things that they have to understand, it becomes very challenging. Um, you got to remember, 15 years ago, truck drivers drove. They didn't have to think about all this other crap. <laughs> now they have to think about a bunch of stuff. And so if you add on top of that, it, it becomes a, a little bit more uh, difficult for the truck driver to understand exactly what, it's, what their responsibility is. Um, and by providing them with an easier solution is, is absolutely the way to go. Yeah, that's great. I'd, I'd love to echo just a couple of points that were made. I think, um, so just to be 100% clear and transparent, like we're not bringing logistics products to market. Uh, <laughs> However, I can, I can build on a, on a point that Kofi made uh, around the importance of, of listening um, and the importance of sort of understanding the end user experience as a critical part of the performance of the product, right? And so recently, uh, we were having a problem with, uh, with, our, with one of Ford's digital products, the remote unlock um, off of the app was taking a, an extraordinary amount of time. Um, and, and we were hearing lots of complaints. Um, but we had this, uh, but we had this like sort of poignant, really salient story that kind of brought home the the, the problem in a way that that made it feel very human. Which was a, a actually a Ford employee uh, had his wife had accidentally uh, locked their their baby daughter in the car, um, and she called in a panic because uh, the car was locked, and and he was like, "Hang on, like I can I can fix this." Um, because he had her car in his app and he was able to remote unlock, but there was a 15 second gap between hitting the unlock button and the car unlocking, um, and which is a long time to wait if, if you have kids uh, locked in cars when it's hot, right? Like that's a, that's a 15 seconds seems like 15 you know, minutes. Uh, and, and what we were able to do is sort of interrogate that event and understand w why they were happening and then you know we're a legacy company so so there are a lot of legacy systems that had to be pinged um, uh, in order to do to like actually achieve some value that was not very valuable uh, and so we were able to say like hey, we can we can solve this problem a different way and, and reduce the unlock time down to two seconds um, that almost feels like your fob right um, and and so 
but, but being able to humanize the impact of technological solutions or legacy technology solutions uh, in a way that sort of brings the, the human value uh, into that equation uh, will at least speed up the response and sort of make it so that people are wanting these changes as opposed to like having them shoved down their throat. Absolutely. Um, I want to change the conversation a little bit to the environment in which you all are playing. Uh, I believe every speaker on the stage has talked about how the supply chain and logistics industry is changing fastest right now and how there are so many people entering the space looking to solve problems. Lydia, you said yourself there are 17 problems with Drage alone. Matthew, you were trying to figure out which problem to talk about and also you were saying 15 years ago, truck drivers, they drove. But today is very different and my question for you is, in a field that can seem crowded to the customer, how do you differentiate yourselves? And in that thinking, where do product ecosystems or increasing product offerings come into question? Uh, I would love to hear this, maybe start with Kofi, work your way down and then end with Lydia, that would be great. Yeah, uh, I think my solution was to get into a different market. Uh, <laughs> we, with Uber Free, we were in a position where when you're thinking about the, the brokerage market, and Lydia could talk much more knowledgeably about this, it's pretty mature. There are 3.5 million truck drivers out there looking for loads, hundreds of billions of dollars of loads that are moved every year, and you're in the middle trying to play into that ecosystem. What we decided to do when I was building up PowerLoop was to think about the process changes that we could actually enact, which meant setting up a new system that fundamentally changed the experience of a truck driver. Uh, that ended up being a solution that I think has been going pretty well over there, and I'm excited to see that continue to trend in the right way. The new market, though, uh, we actually have the inverse problem, which is how do you think about creating a new market that fundamentally hasn't existed before? There's air cargo by planes, by helicopters. There are trucks. There are sprinter vans. But there fundamentally has never been this size drone really ever until a couple weeks ago. So now we're in a situation where we have to try and explain this narrative and this vision in a way where it's still maybe a year or two um, from actually being able to go to market, but that gets the attention of the decision makers in a way that makes them actually want to do something today. Uh, so the strategies that we've implemented with that is really to just think about how can we once again listen to them and and figure out what are the core pain points that they're trying to solve for the future that they're not being able to solve today. For an example, if you're trying to go from one island to another island, you can go by boat or you can go by plane. Uh, we end up being a better solution for you than both of those options, both economically but then also by speed. If you're thinking about challenging infrastructure in a number of regions around the world, once again citing that over a billion people are not connected by roadways, you end up being in a situation where we can fundamentally be able to democratize access to supplies in a very rapid way that you weren't able to do before. Uh, so on the first side, just to recap, it was really thinking about process changes that can actually change the experience of the user and listening to them so that you can give them exactly what they're looking for. And on the second part of it is creating, uh, creating solutions to pain points that are pretty urgent today even if your system is going to be ready in a year or two years. Okay, so differentiation and automation is challenging because right now there's not a commercial vehicle on the market where you're actually operating for a customer. Uh, so with that being said, in the class H space, I can probably rattle off 10 companies that are doing single vehicle automation and I can, I can give you at least one a uh, company that's focused specifically on what we call auto follow, and then a couple of OEMs are doing the same thing. So we do have a fair amount of competition in our space, but we also have to realize that some of those are research projects, some of them might, might never hit the market, uh, and some of them are 10 years away. So if, if you do a little research and you look back you know, five years ago when automation became a really hot topic, not only in the investment world, but in the transportation industry, everybody was talking about automation being around the corner and that you were gonna see automated vehicles driving around San Francisco uh, tomorrow. 
Um, and every year since then, people have been walking back the, the time frame. <laughs> it, it just keeps walking back. You know, Chris Urmson, example of five years ago, said, "Hey, her, his daughter's never going to learn to drive." Well, her daughter's been driving for his dri daughter's been driving for a year now. So, uh, I even if you take the, the biggest experts in the room and, and you figure it out, you know, everybody is is walking back the, the length of time. Uh, so what we did was just how do you how do you get to commercialization as fast as possible? Uh, and so we took a little bit of a different tact on how do you approach automation. Uh, and that's by reducing the ODD to such a constraint that it doesn't require a vehicle uh, to actually drive by itself and to have to have that long tail of development. Um, so we've actually said, okay, we're not gonna operate in certain environments under certain conditions uh, with traffic or in an urban environment. We're gonna operate in the easiest possible way to do it. And we're gonna do it in with technology that exists today. So we're not gonna put uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of LiDAR on the vehicle. We're actually gonna do it with uh, what ZF would call a, a ACC or CMS system today. And so we tried to reduce the constraints down to, to something that is tangible that we could actually go to market with now. Uh, what came out of that was what we call our Platoon Pro system, which is automation, but it's really driver assist. It's not, um, it's not a, a single vehicle automation system. It's, it's platooning. It's vehicle to vehicle connectivity. And we went to market with that. Uh, and using that market, we, we said, okay, let's build on that to create a level of automation. And so we are actually in the marketplace right now with a system that can be automated. And that's very different than the tact of what a lot of people are doing, which is they're saying, okay, my first product is actually going to be a fully automated vehicle. And that, as a result of that, we are starting to get market traction, whereas other companies aren't even in the market yet. Yeah, I think, um, so... Having spent 20 years at IDEO uh, and having sort of uh, human-centered design in my DNA, the, the, the way to differentiate and the way to make sure that, you're, that you will kind of stay differentiated is to make sure that you're solving for real human problems, right? Because, the, because you become the differentiation if you're, if you're creating market demand by, by paying attention to what the market is saying, by paying attention to your users or your potential users and, and hearing them uh, and then solving for their problems. And, you know, it's hard, especially here with the Valley hype cycle, like the noise is so loud, you can really kind of get swept up and like, ah, you know, like, and, and you see this, right? Every year we get a year further away from fully automated vehicles. Um, but, but if you stay close to the, you know, close to what the human need is and authentic to, to where you see the market opportunity. Like the, the differentiation sort of is a result of that rather than paying attention to like, oh, how are we gonna differentiate? Actually solve the other problem first and, like, and you become the differentiation. All right, and the last one. So um, when investors ask me this question, sure. these are my answers. <laughs> The first one is we're the first trucker-centric marketplace. First, it's very important. Um, the reason why it is important is truck drivers is the core of the business. We are having a trucker shortage problem. That's actually the industry's largest problem. That's also the reason why we put majority of the focus on truck drivers. How do we empower them? How do we organize route them, routes for them? And how can we organize a trip for them? How can we allow them to take the loads that they want at the time that they want? And how can we make them $1,000 a day? So those are the areas that we worked on is we offer predictive load offering capabilities. We provide small trucking companies and free fleet management softwares. So that allowed Next Stand Up. And the second is we're the first one that is tackling drainage problem, which is the most complex, most difficult trucking sector. Um, the reason why we're doing it is, one, we're headquartered in LA, the largest port of whole country. 40% of merchandise in this country are imported, and 30% come into LA and Long Beach ports. We're sitting ourselves in the really important place. And a lot of customers of us are actually using the drainage services and the truckload services that we provide. And uh, we always said everybody talk about last mile, mid mile, but not many people talk about first mile. Mm -hmm. But first mile is as important as last mile. Imagine the first domino didn't fall correctly. It's going to impact the entire supply chain, which means 40% of our shelves will be empty. And we will have no food to eat, no clothes to wear, no toys to for the kids. So that's what we do differently. And third is we move very fast. I think we're a very competitive company from top down. 
and we wanted to, I always talk to my team is, you know, the speed is the only competitive advantage. You have a great idea, you have great resources, but at the end of the day, it's execution. How we can do it well, how it, can we do it the best? And we, the company was built four years ago. We found the company four years ago, October 2015. And uh, we grew 100% year over year and we're very profitable. And we also brought in um, great blue chip investors like Sequoia, Brookfield. Last round we brought in Brookfield Growth Venture. The reason why we brought them in is because they own terminals. And because we're tackling a very difficult problem that is drayage and it involves terminal steamship lines. And this is a highly relationship-driven industry. So we need to have the knowledge we need to have the relationships on top of the capital. So we're building a very great team. I actually have Mike Kaplan here. And we are also building a very big tech data science team. So yeah, if anyone's interested in <laughs> joining us to disrupt the $60 billion drainage industry, please come to talk to me after the session. Thank you. I love that. Uh, we are unfortunately, and I really do mean that unfortunately, running out of time here. I would have said I don't like to play favorites and then picked one question, but I don't even think we have time for that. So unfortunately, we're going to have to call the session and invite up our next guest. But uh, before we do that, I do want to thank everybody on stage very, very much for coming in and sharing your insights. We have had everything from, please, please, absolutely, absolutely. Um, everything from customer-centric design to autonomous platooning, drone, cargo to replace air freight, and of course, a trucking app that is uh, trucker-centric and disrupting the market. So thank you again, and thank you all for coming. Another thank you for an exceptional panel sharing insights on the future of mobility. And it's, you know, we, there's all this conversation around the hype and the buzz cycles around autonomy and new modes of transportation, but it's actually really incredible when we can get thought leaders like that out here to start this conversation. Nothing's happening behind me. You know, there's a curtain, <laughs> pretend. Um, but, you know, we're really excited. We have one final interview for everyone, and then we will be transitioning to a couple rapid fire startup pitches and then moving to networking. Um, you know, it's my pleasure at this point to welcome up Raj Rao, General Manager of Industry Platforms at IBM. Raj, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, you've, you know, the conversation thus far has been really focused on future of supply chain, future of logistics. Before we dive in, I'd love you to take a minute or two and give some context on your background and kind of your evolution inside the supply chain, the logistics business, and, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Uh, I, I won't go back to the beginning of uh, my career. Um, but my, my first involvement was dealing with Amazon. Uh, this was about 13 years ago. Uh, trying to switch on a supply chain into their DCs. It was early days, they were trying to change the future of Office Max, Staples, and Office Depot. Basically, try to destroy their businesses. And when I was at 3M, uh, these companies were major accounts uh, for Post-it and Scotch tape and this, that, or the other. So hearing that threat, uh, the question was, do we want to fortify our relationships with the existing companies, which bought in truckloads, we ship stuff to their DCs, they pull that into their stores, and most of the purchases are contract purchases. Uh, Amazon's bet was that the office buyer would behave the same way you and I behave right now, uh, which is they would departmentalize purchases and they would buy on demand. They would not have some EA or someone go and look at a catalog and then buy what's approved in the back room. So that was a big change for our team, uh, being able to deal with shipping one case of product to six different locations, and before we ship anything, to have rich content set up, and be able to describe back outs, which were very different than the way we were manufacturing things. 
was uh, very tough for the ERP system that we had in place. It wasn't built to do that. Uh, ERP systems are generally built for volume and scale. They're not built for agility and quick hits. So we had to do a lot of uh, uh, maneuvering. Uh, Amazon eventually became a $450 million account for 3M and still growing. So it's the third largest key account in the US. So we took that same model. We had a very different experience in China. Um, Alibaba and Taobao deal very differently. They prefer to deal through uh, traders and dealers in the platform. They don't like brands because of issues to do with counterfeit. So they don't want to get into situations where they're brand police. They don't like doing that. So outside of the US, we actually used digital platform for supply chain efficiency. And we created a digital first supply chain because we felt everything else was easier after that. So we started with the car care market. The aftermarket after for car care products was a big opportunity for 3M. Uh, subsequent to that stuff that um, Jonah may have touched on from Ford was my more recent background. So dealing with you know, how do you supply to um, the automotive back office, which is they tell you when to bring your vehicle in for service. They tell you how long it's going to take. And, and they tell you how much they're going to charge you after you get there. Uh, of course, newer cars will make it mandatory for you to go there because they'll shut down, basically. So my car will not perform if I don't take it for service when it tells me to take it for service. The issue on the B2B side, uh, which is what Jonah and I were working on together in his previous, my previous job, was how do you do that when you have on-demand transit? Uh, now, Uber driver is not going to take his car in for service randomly and leave it there for a day because it's income. Uh, so with Chariot, which was a company that Ford had purchased, the supply chain had to be completely different. We had to move to a completely different dealer capability. So I think, by and large, uh, my view is supply chains aren't built for speed, and they're not built for agility. And you know, working through ERP systems is not easy. You have to work around it for the most part. So that's been my experience so far. So you know, starting with how do I get a case of post-it notes to the right place at the right time, to how do I get people their car back, and now how do I create the technology platforms that are going to enable businesses all over the world mm -hmm. to do that exact same thing. You know, we've been having a conversation around the opportunity in supply chain innovation, um, but I'd love to get your thoughts on you know what are the challenges that we're solving for. You know, what are some of the the big hairy audacious goals that we should be executing against in the supply chain space? Yeah, I mean, we can do a lot with robotics and automation and AI and all buzzwords that are out there. I think the most fundamental problem we probably have to cope with and the generation immediately after that is much simpler challenge, which is surety of supply. Uh, if you, you know, follow the news, you know what's going on with trade wars, you've heard about Brexit, you've heard about all the challenges to existing supply chains. And it's not an easy problem to go solve when you raise tariff barriers, uh, mostly man-made, it locks out certain supply channels. Uh, and to switch on a new supply base is very complicated. Uh, you can't shift manufacturing from China to Vietnam that easily because the ports in Vietnam cannot carry that load, uh, even if they can manufacture it. So I feel that you know what you mentioned, I think what I was taught is this notion of VUCA, which is the world is very volatile, it's uncertain, it's chaos, it's ambiguous. It's not getting better it's getting worse. And I think the most fundamental use of technology is surety of supply, is how can you have transparency and visibility in a supply chain so when you have to make a switch, you can make that switch in real time. And I think that's going to be a human challenge because I don't think we are resilient enough to be able to cope with that change. No, it makes sense. It's kind of like a modern solutions for modern problems, you know, type type of situation. And and you you know you reference the role that at least one point of technology can play. But I think yeah. you know there's a huge emphasis on you know technology driven innovation. And I'm curious from your perspective, how much of the gap or the opportunity is developing new technologies, and how much of it are cultural mindset, you know, structural changes that can happen inside the market. Yeah, I find that. Um if you lead with technology, you have to force the culture to come along. Uh, if you lead with culture, you're never going to climb the technology curve. Because by and large, we don't like change. Uh, we prefer certainty. It's just programmed in our DNA. Uh, as hunter-gatherers, we always want certainty of food on the table. 
So I think it's, you know, lead with technology. I work with a lot of retailers now, and I think they are trying to, you know, respond to you and I wanting to know where this food is coming from, you and I wanting to know what's in the food. You know, how do you get that information in real time? How do you provide trace in real time? How do you have provenance on it to prove that it's organic or sustainable? Uh, and that's forcing a cultural shift at the back room of Walmart and McDonald's and all the big guys who have never had to deal with the millennials with their iPhones, right? That are saying, I'm gonna go to Sweet Greens instead where I get all that information, right? And I, I'd rather go there than come here and have not know where the chicken came from. So I think we saw Carrefour do that in Europe uh, and they decided to do it with private label chicken and they switched on a complete private label platform with chicken led with blockchain. They transformed how they managed cold chain and then the culture of the organization was you have to get caught up with the opportunity to bring more people into your store and sell them high value product. Well, and, and what's so interesting about that is, you know, you're leading with the use case, which is mm -hmm. one of the, the core challenges I think that we've seen at least as these emerging technologies come out is the tech in a vacuum seems really compelling, but until you really find how that fits into a workflow and how that fundamentally changes business dynamics, uh, adoption's hard. You know, I think one of the buzzwords we hear a lot about inside supply chain and logistics is AI, IoT, kind of this intelligent new world of yep. data, you know, that maybe it provides transparency, maybe it provides precision and flexibility. As you look at the AI, IoT, and kind of emerging data space, what are you excited about and, and what do you think is more hype than, you know, reality? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a slightly longer answer to that if you don't mind, <laughs> okay? So uh, I'm going to go back 35 years, okay? 1975. Uh, world population is 3.5 billion. The average human consumes about 1,800 calories, okay? You fast forward 35 years, our world's population has doubled, and the per capita consumption is 3,600 calories, okay? GDP has grown from 20 trillion in that time frame to 80 trillion, okay? So four, four go growth in our ability to spend and twice the population. So the per capita income has grown not linearly, but exponentially. What that means is that we have a lot more people to feed, and we have to feed each person a lot more. That presents a huge challenge in terms of how are you going to now get let IoT and AI and ML solve that problem. That's a existential problem, because 2050, you're gonna have another three billion people around us who are gonna consume even more processed food than today. So the problem is not gonna go away with time. It's gonna get more and more. So we formed a joint venture with Yara, which is the world's largest fertilizer company. And they sell direct to 10 million farmers around the world. And our goal was to put agri-IoT sensors in the ground, because the one thing you can't do is, unlike traditional supply chains, where you can tell someone, I want 15 of that on Tuesday afternoon, the truck's gonna get to you at 4 p.m., make sure your dock's ready, load the truck, it's gonna go out. You can't tell that to a cucumber plant. <laughs> you cannot tell a cucumber plant, I'm sending a truck to the field next Tuesday, make sure you're ripe, <coughs> okay? So there's variability of weather, there's variability of growing conditions, and there's variability of soil or what's called inputs into a farm. No human is going to be able to look through a three hectare farm, which is the average size of a smallholder farm. The bigger farms are five, 10,000 hectares. Nobody is gonna go and inspect when that cucumber is gonna be ready. That's where IoT and agri-IoT can play a role in predicting very accurately what growing conditions will lead to an outcome, as in, I can harvest this. Very excited about that. What we're also excited about is learning, if I have to improve yield, what kind of crop should I switch to, and when should I make that switch? That also has moved to the cloud now, which is pretty interesting. I think the final piece, the trifecta of that, is really being able to action that information with a smartphone. Uh, and actually, it's, a, it's not even a smartphone, it's a feature phone. So what we're doing with cocoa farmers in Africa is creating a way to send them those alerts and messages and create the knowledge bridge with them. And we're doing it with a Geneva-based company called Sukafina, which gives you Starbucks coffee and gives you Nescafe and gives you all the brands you love. Okay, somebody has to actually grow that coffee bean. So, so these farmers are incentivized to go down this route because when you buy that coffee, uh, the story is that if you pay $3 for a cup of pike, 
from, from Starbucks, about four cents goes to the farmer. Now, you can argue that's very inefficient. You know, you're paying three dollars to the store and four cents goes to the farmer. The farmer earns about $180 a month. That's their farm income. So to change that model, one of the things you can do with the phone is uh, you and I can trace the journey of that coffee bean. And we can actually help that community uh, build better schools and create a more sustainable income for them long term. That's called the circular economy, right? You all heard about it. We actually see this happening at scale in food. And that's the third part of it. So if you use a smartphone for connectivity, so you need a telco in the player, you need an IoT with smart sensors that, that help you get the data that you need, and you have AI to process that information and automate action. So I think that, that's what we see happening at scale. It's happening not just in coffee, it's happening in cocoa, it's happening in, in a lot of commodities where you have large scale farms and you need massive intervention to solve that problem, which is our population is doubling and people want more. No, it makes sense. And what I find so interesting is that, you know, endless, you know, fleets of autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, the silver bullets that I think a lot of people look at aren't coming up in the conversation, but it's more of this ecosystem of, you know, end-to-end -end technologies and value chain that all of a sudden are starting to work together the way we, we'd like them to, but historically couldn't because we were in the way. Are you seeing similar dynamics as you look at things like blockchain and other emerging technologies, or how should you orient yourself in this kind of brave new world of tech coming after the supply chain? Yeah, I think that, you know, in DevOps last year, there was, the phrase was coined the, the machine age 2.0. And if you think about companies you heard from on stage, the whole era of, of Amazon and Facebook and Google and all the modern successes we've heard about is about doing things differently. We're now at a point where we need to do different things, not just do things differently. So, so when we start thinking about what can we do differently, that's when things like AV and things like robotics at scale start playing a role. I think you and I imagine that an AV is an Uber vehicle without a driver. That's not a winning use case. The winning use case is uh, the company I visited yesterday restocks all the Starbucks at night. And for noise abatement, they have to do it between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. And they cannot have contact with any of the staff in the, in the store, so that's where they finish it then. That's a perfect use case for a robot, right? It doesn't have human contact. It's a known route, it's a known delivery cycle, it's known products, and you can electrify it. So as you might know, the secret is all AV is gonna be electric. It's not going to go to a fuel station and fuel itself, right? So it's gonna be electrified, it's gonna be driverless, and it's gonna be self-deterministic. It's gonna have its own eyes and ears, and it's gonna know how to navigate and complete a mission. That's all coming. It's coming very quickly. Uh, you and I may not see it, because we may not be awake at night when these things happen, but there are already companies that are trailblazing in this area right now. And, you know, Ocado in, in Europe does this for grocery. They pick back, like Instacart, they don't have humans. They actually have robots, uh, 17,000 robots, picking and packing individual cases that get shipped to people's homes. Uh, you know, there are a number of examples of this happening. Amazon's doing it at all the warehouses, as you know, Kiva robots at scale. So I, I imagine that we'll see this, but it won't be in the way you and I think it's going to be. It's not going to be the taxi pulling up with nobody in it. I think that may be later. Uh, but we can't underestimate what is actually going on with these technologies. Well, it seems like there are enough big problems to solve that mm -hmm. don't require the driverless car mm -hmm. um, to, to really go after. And, you know, if, if folks have been paying attention, uh, you probably have noticed food coming up um, consistently in the food supply chain. You're currently leading IBM's Global Food Initiative. And I'm curious, what do you see as the role of blockchain in some of those technologies and, and really driving that next generation of, of food supply chains and feeding the billions sure. of people that are emerging around the world? Sure. So, so there are Problems you know about, but probably don't talk about it too much, which is, is the food that you're consuming the real food? And, and there's mislabeling and there's fraud, both's going on, okay? Uh, there are some recent articles in Wall Street Journal about the volume of food fraud and food mislabeling in the seafood industry in New York. 72% of the <laughs> seafood being consumed is not really seafood. Uh, it's, it's just mind boggling. So I think job number one is provenance. Is this thing actually what 
it purports to be. And that's not a simple problem to solve. That is very complex because immutability of the data and permissioning of the data and sharing of the data is an ecosystem play like the fax machine. And a blockchain is similar to an ATM network or a fax network, right? Everybody needs to be on for everyone to benefit, but you don't have to see everyone's data. You only have to see data that is permission to you. And you shouldn't be able to erase data and change it because it's just bad habit to go and change something that's not true. So blockchain has captured the imagination uh, of a lot of retailers that want to build trace uh, and provenance. The, where it's headed is compliance has smart contracts. Uh, so is this supply chain compliant with sustainability <coughs> standards? Do they follow fair trade practices? So blockchain is becoming interesting. I think the cryptocurrency side clouds people's judgment. They think it's a, a control play. They think by putting data into a network, other people will see it. So there's a lot of education involved with that. But we're moving past blockchain uh, in terms of applications, we're building more and more applications on top of blockchain. So one example I can give you is a crypto anchor. So crypto anchor is a spectrum analyzer that tells you if the olive oil you're using at home is real olive oil or not. It can be used on a smartphone, uh, and it has the photomagnetic signature of real stuff. So that's being used in the back rooms right now to prevent parts fraud food fraud, so on and so forth. But it's only a matter of time before you and I start using it daily. Oh, it makes sense. And I mean, uh, I'm tired of buying extra virgin olive oil that mm -hmm. is not, probably, well, yeah. it's not only not it's extra virgin. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know it's, it's super interesting. And I think your particular journey provides a different perspective than a lot of people who come into this space. Mm -hmm. You know, you started uh, working on supply chain for one of the largest industrial manufacturers, managing 125,000 SKUs on the market. Uh, it's probably one of the most complex um, supply chains in the world. Then to, you know, a single kind of used car supply chain, but with itself unbelievable complexity and you know, being a supply chain partner, to then moving over to the technology mm -hmm. side. And I'm curious, as you, you know, talk to a, a Fortune 500 supply chain leader that's kind of looking at, again, this brave new world yeah. of supply chain technology, what advice would you have for them? Where would you tell them to start? What's the mindset to bring in to, to start that long journey? Yeah, I, I think it starts with having a winning idea. Uh, I think, you know, um, the idea shouldn't come just from waking up one morning and, and thinking of something new to do. I think it has to be a conversation that takes place in the company uh, about what it's going to take for a different future for the company in a specific area where the company wants to grow or solve a problem. Once you have a winning idea, I, I think it requires controlled experiments. You know, I've known Alec for some time now, and one of the things that attracted me to come into GSV Labs and set up shop here for 3M was the idea that we could recruit differently and we could set different expectations, right? And we were trying to borrow a playbook from Barney's work with JetBlue Ventures, which was travel as far as you can from the headquarters so you don't have the protection, and then you're, you're completely exposed because all the experiments are out there, people come and observe and judge. And you do demo days, you pitch, uh, instead of politicking, you actually pitch and earn when people are going to do that later today, I believe. And, and your idea should win. It sh shouldn't be a relationship you have or somebody owes you something or, you know, uh, you know, voting process, right? A winning idea should. So my advice to companies any size, particularly the larger ones, is how do you empower enough people in the company to want to do that? And I learned a lot from my first foray into this with Amazon and this was way back when they were much smaller, was, uh, and you probably know this, the two pizza rule at Amazon, where they didn't want any team working on a project that couldn't be fed, fed with two pizzas. So the average team size is six, and it still is, okay? And we learned a lot from that. The average team size of 3M is about 50 times that, right? Uh, and, and everything that get done in a committee, it takes time, it's, you know, it's, it's a process, right? And, and so I th my advice would be, how can you change that narrative to come up with winning ideas? And how can you approach them with small teams? And Jonah works for IDEO, and I had worked together with, with something called Greenfield Labs, with Ford to launch 31 experiments simultaneously around the world with, a, with small teams, not 5,000 people, right? Uh, and you know, 26 of those 31 did not, didn't work out. The five that did work out went through the process, so we brought people along. 
So I think it's it's kind of the mindset of I wouldn't say Silicon Valley, but the mindset of a startup, MVP, uh, generational shift in who you put on the team, and then the environment you put yourself into. Uh, that's why I met, you know, mentioned GSV. I think having discomfort is a good thing. You know, I, Kathleen and I um, had this conversation about should we send a team out to WeWork to go do the work? Because it becomes uncomfortable. You're surrounded by people who are fine with being uncomfortable. There's no space that's yours. The desk's not yours. Everything's on demand. It just makes you think differently about the value you're creating. So I think that's all it is, a very simple human instinct. We've got to break habits. We've got to feel, you know, we've got to sweat in the morning when we wake up saying, am I going to have my job tomorrow? And, you know, am I getting ahead? I think these are very fundamental things that drive success. That's been my experience for 14 years, and I, I stand by it. Yeah. So just a couple super simple minor yeah. cultural changes inside of a big company, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you've got to have the right CEO. You know, you have the right CEO. He demands that. Yeah, right, right leadership. And I, I think that it segues into a great question, which is what happens if you don't, you know, make that leap of faith? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you accept it, you know, what we need to do is marginal improvement year over year rather yeah. than a 180 degree kind of about face. What, what do you, you know, with the tenure on the S&P yeah. falling as quickly as it is, you know, what do you think the future yeah, I of think, companies are? I think are? That, that fear psychosis worked for a couple of years and people have gotten used to that. You know, I won't exist, you know, that kind of, that fear is gone. I think it's the fear of getting left behind. Uh, I think none of us want to personally get left behind in anything that we do. You, know, you don't go home at night and say, I got left behind, it's okay, right? But I think personalizing that and being able to have that recognition that there's only going to be one leader and there are going to be several followers is a scary thought because the winner does take all. And we've seen that play out. You know, IBM wasn't first with cloud, you know, and we are still catching up. And we made a $36 billion bet, you know, two months ago buying Red Hat to help us get ahead. So that's the cost of not doing it in the beginning. So it do, it's not existential, it's just that it's gonna cost you a whole lot more to catch up, and then the guy that's ahead is not waiting for you to catch up, right? They're already going to the next, next game. I saw that happen with Amazon in category after category, and there's you've got a lot of bad press for it. But in reality, they've shown the world that you got to be ahead and stay ahead. No, it makes sense. One of the charts we had up there earlier was as Amazon's average click to delivery time mm -hmm. decreased, mm -hmm. how every other merchant literally just perfectly kind of tracked along and tried to follow this chase because in the end of the day, you know, disproportionate gains go to the market leader. And, you know, we'll have a couple minutes to a answer a question or two from the audience. Um, but my final question to you before we throw out there um, is, you know, there's so much conversation around supply chain innovation, logistics, mm -hmm. autonomy, um, so many things that are hype, so many buzzwords that everyone's focused on today. What's one thing that people aren't, you know, spending all their time talking about and focusing about today, but you think a year from now is actually going to be a huge growth opportunity or something that people are trying to wrap their head around? I, I think uh, visual computing is very early days. Uh, I, I think the ability to automate at scale by using vision computing in supply chain is massive. Uh, we have a number of airlines that are doing it right now for baggage handling, but when you start putting it you know, at scale, I, I think the whole future of AV is dependent on it, um, knowing where everything is in the network. So I think 5G is big. I think if you haven't paid attention to 5G uh, as a disruptive business platform, that's dangerous uh, because it allows you to stream at, at phenomenal rates. Uh, which allows real-time uh, vision computing outcomes, which is massively transformational. Uh, so retinal scanning can be real-time, biometric scanning can be in real-time. You, you, know, you and I can get through the airport in no time because you'll be scanned, whether you like it or not, uh, and the system will decide you know, whether you go or not go. Today, the number of transactions required to get through that is just unbelievable. So the simple use case is the there's no driver behind the autonomous vehicle. He can't decide whether you should get in or not. Something's gonna decide to open that door and let you in, and that's not gonna be based on how it feels about you. It's gonna be some scanning that takes place. So I think the first iteration of that will be um, you know, vision computing. There are gonna be many things after that, sensing computing and those kind of little further out, uh, but this is within five years. 
Wonderful. And, you know, Raj, thank you so much for answering my questions. I want to, we have a couple minutes left. If there are any questions from the audience we'd like to get out there, someone from our team will run over with a microphone. Hey there, my name's Sam Blackman from uh, Nuvo Cargo. Um, thanks for that, Raj. I, I want to hark back to an earlier point you made about the importance of transparency and visibility in the supply chain. Um, I'm interested in your opinion on how much we need to increase the um, granularity of the data points that we capture along the way to see a meaningful increase in uh, transparency and visibility. And when, if ever, do we hit kind of diminishing returns on that granularity? Yeah, good question. I'll uh, try and give you a food example if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. So um, one thing I learned uh, is with blueberries, you don't report the date it was picked. It's meaningless. Uh, you go by best buy date. Because most of the blueberries only are harvested three months a year, and then they go into cold storage. So the level of granularity that you're talking about is, it's never too much, but at some point you don't need the data. So we don't need the pluck date, we need the pluck time. Because when you pluck it between 6.15 in the morning and 9.30, it's going to last a lot longer and stay fresher for longer. The hotter it gets, it loses, it loses the acidity, which means it loses flavor faster. So I don't think there's a diminishing return per se, but if you are not able to action that in a use case, that data is pretty meaningless. I haven't seen yet any data that's been of no use. So. You know, I work with Emerson on their transport sensors, uh, and they're like, well, we do it for compliance. I'm like, do you know that one of our clients wants to use that to reduce cost of delivery? Even though it's a fixed haulage, they want to reduce your cost so they can get the benefit back. So there are a lot of reasons why you need to think about a level of granularity in data, because the use cases can get caught up. I find that we're not really making a commitment to get that data onto platforms where that data can be used. It's trapped in silos, and getting it out of that silo, that's where blockchain's interesting, that if you can connect to those data sets, other people can monetize it differently. Wonderful. One, one time for one last question. Hi, I'm Jerry Sessler from SDMR Advisory Services. I work a lot in healthcare, and, and they face a lot of the same issues of verifiability mm -hmm. in their supply chain that you're talking yep. about with food, uh, pharmaceuticals, et mm -hmm. cetera. And what you didn't, well, you talked about the verifiability of the items themselves. What I'm curious about is the cybersecurity of mm -hmm. the safety of the food, mm -hmm. right? So I'm curious what your thoughts are on cybersecurity yeah. in the food supply. So Frank Yanis uh, is the current FDA deputy director. He's the guy that wrote the paper that got IBM to invest in blockchain for food. So his question was mangoes. He didn't know if the mangoes that were selling in Walmart stores was safe because of all the recall issues. Uh, same thing applies to pharma, right? Is the stuff I'm buying going to be safe when I take it home and eat it? So he wanted to do trace on the mangoes. He wanted to know where it came from and if it was processed the right way because a lot of tests for salmonella and other problems with fruit, for example. So he, he wanted, it took him two weeks to figure out where the mango came from. It came from a farm in Latin America, and with blockchain, he got it in 1.7 seconds. That's on the web. It's, uh, it's a famous video. So I, I think traceability of something being safe is a function of both knowing whether it came through the supply chain the right way, and whether it, it arrived on time or didn't arrive on time, and did it go through all the compliance checks. And usually these things can be hand-entered, which is a problem. Uh, because the bad actors hand, en hand enter that information. So we have to fully automate or it's not worth it. Pharma is leading that right now. So FDA is working with USDA to mandate that rigor more and more for trace and recall first and then eventually for full provenance. Right. Perfect. Raj, thank you so thank much you. for your time and really appreciate the perspective today. No problem. Thank you. And so at this point, we are about uh, 
15, 20 minutes away from food, networking, and cocktails, which we know everyone's ready for. Uh, we've got four presentations from some emerging startup founders right now to share their perspective on how the work they're doing is transforming the supply chain and logistics innovation space. Um, we're gonna be a little bit sloppy and have them present up here with chairs on so that you don't have to deal with another stage transition. Um, but we'll e introduce them one at a time and each one will have a couple minutes to go and share what they're working on. Um, you know, first and foremost, really excited to announce the CEO of Throughput. Do you want to take the chairs off or just go up there? All right. The chairs are st staying with me, so. Well, I don't have any pitch deck, so uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Ali Raza, and I'm the CEO of Throughput. Uh, we were just voted the most disruptive startup at Stanford a couple of weeks ago, so thank you for that. Uh, we're a pretty interesting company. We eliminate bottlenecks across the globe in the $35 trillion supply chain. Uh, our footprint now extends from the largest canals to stuff that ends up on the Mars rover. So it's an exciting time for throughput, and it's a big problem. Most people don't know this, but bottlenecks actually disrupt all operations, and they're the highest recurring costs within any organization. Not only do they lead to cost leakage, but they also prevent growth. So if you don't solve your bottlenecks, you're kind of stuck, right? What we've done is we've looked across 13 different industries, although we're active more on automotive manufacturing these days, and we realized that we can use existing data, not new IT, edge stuff. Most of the world is not on this new stuff. Only 4% of companies use uh, AI today in supply chain. We tap into the existing data. We have a platform called Eli, which is based off of the theory of constraints, which was made famous by Elio Goldratt of the goal. And we improve things for operations, like lead time, uptime, downtime. We help any operation run smoother, better, faster, safer, and leaner. How we've built this, it's taken three years, right? We've actually worked with the Toyota family that invented just in time. We worked with uh, Goldratt's co-founder, Dr. Alan Bernard, who will be here on the 23rd to the 27th speaking for us, as well as the Total Quality Management Board uh, to eliminate these bottlenecks in real time. Uh, in terms of industry trends, what we're seeing is that the Valley kind of has it backwards. Let me explain. So I'm an ex-operations manager who graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with chemical and engineering degrees. And what I realized working at Schlumberger, taking care of discrete manufacturing, pro, you know, uh, continuous manufacturing, batch man manufacturing, offshore logistics, onshore logistics, war zone logistics, is that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be there. And there's about 10 trillions of dollars that if we free up using data, that's enough working capital to solve all of humanity's problems. So if you want to pay, you know, take care of economic inequality, you can solve it. You can take care of universal health care. You can take care of paying everyone's literacy. So there's enough waste in supply chain today that if you were to redistribute all that working capital to human capital, it's going to solve a lot of problems. So that's why we get up every morning uh, to solve this problem. Seth, Jay, and Bosker are in the room. And uh, effectively, that's what we work towards. right? And so uh, the trends that we're seeing is that the reality is that 87% of businesses today are not ready for BI tools like Click and Tableau and Looker that are having these huge acquisitions today. 4% uh, of companies use AI. 66% of people don't even have digital transportation strategies in place, right? Uh, we're actually going to meet people in Cleveland next week, 50 CIOs, just to talk about this. So what do you do with your existing data to actually make an impact today rather than when your $20 million SAP or progress implementation is done, right? And don't get me wrong, we're partners with Cloudera, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, Hortonworks, and Microsoft, we're all there, right? And so what we do is within 24 hours, we can come quantify the data from the factory floor, tell you how much money you're leaving by not doing digital transformation, and eliminate the bottlenecks in real time. That's what our product, Eli, does. Where we see the industry heading is Silicon Valley is not going to set the tone for OT, right? Operations people, the next generation of millennials and Generation Z, what do you call it? They now know how to use machine learning, AI, and new tools. They're going to effectively know their problems and solve them. This is what we're seeing with our clients in Germany, what we're seeing in our clients with Japan. They know the problem best. They understand. Once they understand how to use the tool, they're going to develop the next generation of solutions. So if you're interested in learning more about throughput, uh, we're back there. We're going to be presenting. Uh, Seth Page is running our fundraising round right now. We just closed a very oversubscribed round. And uh, Bosker, our CTO, is also here if, in case you have tech questions, and Jay's there to talk to any customers. I know a couple of customers reached out to us previously, and uh, I'm here till about 7 as well. So thank you for your time, and uh, see you later today. Bye. Thank you, Ali. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Russell Jones, the CEO of Cargo Chief. Thank you very much. 
Hey, everybody. Great to be here today. Awesome conversations here for sure. So what Cargo Chief does is we help out brokers, freight brokers. There's thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, because other types of 3PL. And the problems that they have is that each broker is trying to figure out which of the hundreds of thousands of trucking companies they should work with with their next load. And they have no idea which trucking company to work with. And their digital freight ma uh, uh, brokerage matching or digital brokerage is just starting to happen. It's like two-tenths of one percent. It's being reported. Yeah, on the other side, you have all these trucking carriers. They're running empty something like 15 or 25, 30 percent of the time, and they have no idea which of the thousands of brokers is going to give them their next load and what they should do. And they're tiny and they're small. Most of them aren't using a computer even to keep track of their business, they're using a whiteboard and an Excel spreadsheet. So a lot of problems and all this lack of data and, and, and con connectivity is hindering their growth. So Cargo Chief has an unparalleled array of integration technologies that enable any size trucking company to seamlessly share its capacity information, available trucks, with our platform, and then we aggregate that together and present that to our customer either through an API, uh, our website, or into, uh, our, uh, into their transportation management system. So if it's a large trucking carrier, We'll do an API, an EDI, a flat file table integration, a direct integration into their TMS or transportation management system. If it's a smaller carrier where the majority of trucks are, we'll scrape, we'll scrape their Google Sheet. We have um, our own TMS called Tracks that we, that can uh, that's for free. We're leaning towards our partnership with Ascend, the largest TMS for small carriers. We've mastered hundreds of different formats in terms of uh, parsing capacity auto uh, emails. I'll talk about the available trucks from the carrier. We have a huge database, the most sophisticated database in the industry of 100,000 lanes of data telling the, our customers which carriers run what lanes, how often, what service days, what frequency. Uh, we also are getting active in the world of electronic logging device. We all talked about that earlier today, the treasure trove of information there. We also have load history. So that comes together to our database and we bring that together. This is one of our products that called C4, Cargo Chief Carrier Capacity. Then we have another product called Booking Assistant. So on behalf of our client, we go out to the carrier. In this example here, you can see it's Dave. Dave, the dispatcher. Hey, Dave, you told us you want to load uh, Oakland to Texas. Our client here, ABC Brokerage, has a load Oakland to Dallas. And uh, here's all the details. You can accept now and when. You can counter bid. You can tell us the truck line is no, no longer available. So this is bringing to the, uh, the huge a uh, long tail of the industry, automated matching of, of supply and demand of trucking capacity. We have gotten a, a very compelling ROI. If you go to our website, you'll see our ROI calculator. Most customers are getting a 10x or a 1,000% ROI with our technology. Um, and we have um, a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, pitches or, um, I guess, testimonials. You can see those on our website as well. In terms of what's happening in the industry, brokers are under attack, real attack. Convoys raise ten or hundreds of millions of dollars. There's great technical innovations coming out. Uber's completed this huge uh, IPO, and they're buying the business at 1% gross margin. How many people are in an industry where their competitors have just closed an $8 billion uh, IPO, and they're doing business at 1% gross margin? Amazon Freight, they have announced a 0% gross margin uh, brokerage. Uh, they have huge freight spend, and they're under attack. They're coming after our uh, traditional freight brokers that still dominate. There's thousands of these guys. They spend something like, I don't know, $70 billion, $8 billion on freight. It's huge. So we're empowering these freight brokers to have the same game-changing technology that the guys on the right have, and they would never develop it on their own. So as a wrap-up, Cargo Chief is an exceptional opportunity. First, it's a great market. You have hundreds and thousands of buyers and sellers uh, in this huge seven or eight hundred billion dollar marketplace, and a lot of people are saying Cargo Chief is a is a is a is a low risk because it's an extension of a very well received service. We were initially a freight broker that grew to tens of millions of dollars and tens of thousands of loads uh, being processed. That's a great business model. Helping our clients be more productive and more profitable, enabling them to survive is very compelling and sticking. And we get to cash flow positive with less than a million dollars of planned spending.
Then we have a lot of pa uh, 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 unfair advantages. We're not, we've just received our fifth patent. Um, our powerful AI generates insights that, no, that people in this room couldn't because there's so much data that's available to us. The advanced automation helps our clients be more effective and more efficient. Lastly, the timing is great. We have literally universal demand from large and small brokers, and we just closed a giant deal with BASF. Come on by if you're interested. Um, we're in one of those tables uh, around, the f around the corner. We're doing something very interesting in pricing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Russell. Our next presentation is from Jay Lee of Stratio. Hello, everyone. My name is Jay from Stratio. OK. Even today, we heard about the uh, counterfeit seafood in New York City. Uh, the general said there is 72% counterfeit or mislabeled seafood selling in the in New York City. Blockchain seems to be a great solution to solve everything. But there is a one pitfall that you heard today. If everything is automated, it's going to solve all the problems. But when you heard about everything is automated, it's almost impossible if you really go to the on-site and see how people are doing things there. So we want to make sure that things are safe, rather than depending on the fully automated terms. People can counterfeit or mislabel things because they look alike. So that means if you only see the visible image of something, you are very tempted to be misled by the visible image. Stradio is a company specialized in the infrared imaging. When I say infrared imaging, we cover from the IR sensor to the, all the AI that support that what you're seeing is really what you're thinking. This is a slide about the market side there. Some people say there's one trillion US dollar being a counterfeit product being sold around the international, and less than 2% are being inspected. So this is, this, that means it's a big, really a big market, right? At Stradio, we invented two products. The first one is called LingScript Portable Spectroscopy. When you scan one spot or some area, we guarantee that this is what you're looking at because we not only see the visible light, but we also see the infrared right, light. This is already a well-selling product, and people are using it for their scientific research or also to guarantee that the things they're looking at is the real one. While we're talking to a lot of customers, they said it's a very good product, it's really working well, but we're not only looking at the one spot of something, I want to see the bulk of the material. So currently we're working on the beyond sense. This is almost like a camera, but it's not really a camera. It's, it's, it's called swear camera. With this, you can actually see what you're seeing is what really that is, because we can see some sort of uh, chemical bonding uh, perspective. So with these things, of course, you can do fluid analysis. You can see whether the metal you're looking at is true or false. Uh, uh, recently, Australia also awarded the uh, Air Force SBIR because we think we can see whether the paint under uh, the crows under the paint could be uh, it really. You have to repaint the aircraft or something like that because of that. We are recent awardee of uh, Air Force uh, SBIR recently. Anyway, uh, with this, we think we can reduce the cost dramatically around the world because we can fight the uh, counterfeit products. The, the thing I really want to emphasize today is uh, uh, infrared image can do a lot of things, but uh, I just want to focus on the labeling. If you go out there, you can see 1D barcode, 2D QR code, invisible ink, and a lot of things that people are trying to label the product uh, so that it, they can make sure that this is the one they're really buying. But if you see the uh, analysis of this chart, uh, there, one or two things are missing for each solution. Uh, what we're trying to present today, if you go to the uh, table uh, in the back there, we're presenting 3D QR code. What that means is even with your naked eye, you only see one QR code, or you don't see the QR code at all. But with our camera, you see multiple layer of QR code. That means people not, cannot easily steal the QR code from you and make sure that this is produced by you only. Um, this is possible because we're not only the pro provider of the sensor, but we also provide the ink as well. So combining the ink and the square camera, you can guarantee that this is your product. Uh, we've been talking to this, and we have demoed this to a lot of people, and a lot of people show that they probably want to install this because this is also a very cheap solution for most of the uh, packaging. Some people say uh, anti-counterfeit packaging market size is about three to four billion. 
uh, but this is very conservative estimation, so we believe it's going to be much bigger, and it's going to be bigger and bigger every day uh, with the right technology, which is what we provide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. And last but not least, it's my pleasure to welcome Edmund Zagorn to the stage from BitOps. Hey, folks. Uh, I know that I'm the last speaker between y'all and uh, some, some good food and drinks, so I'll, I'll keep my remarks relatively brief. Um, BitOps uh, operates in one of the most uh, boring and difficult areas of business today, the wonderful world of procurement and supply chain. Um, we make a product called Vendor Negotiation AI. And today, uh, we have a patented uh, AI engine focused around negotiations and major Fortune 500s and public agencies in both North America and Europe. We have a global customer base with recognizable brands and some of the largest companies, including uh, manufacturing, uh, as well as services companies, work with us uh, to do their vendor negotiations. But I want to take a step back. Uh, has anyone here ever participated in an RFP or RFQ? If you have, raise your hands. OK, keep them raised if you enjoyed it. Right, it's a terrible process. Uh, it's an incredibly bad customer experience, consistently super low NPS. Um, and the reasons for why this is true are actually relatively simple from the procurement side of the table. There are too many vendors. It's really hard to know which vendors are the right vendors. Um, there are a lot of requirements. Sometimes those requirements conflict. And if you're a strategic sourcing manager and you're running a whole team, there are a lot of opportunities to create value in the company, and it's kind of tough to know where to start. But imagine, just for a second, that you're brand new to strategic sourcing. You've never done it before, and you're approaching this problem kind of with a fresh mind. Does it really make sense to ask strangers to guess what your most desirable offer should be? Isn't there something fundamentally wrong with the process of vendor negotiations in that we ask people to submit quotes over and over again until someone guesses what's close to what we want? And this is really where BitOps comes in. So we leverage a core insight. We use AI to coach vendors what they should offer you. Um, we use historical transaction data about both you and them. And we leverage a core psychological insight that's been studied by the Harvard Negotiation Project uh, surveying data of over 40 years of business negotiations, which is that whoever goes first has a fundamental advantage in any negotiation due to a psychological effect known as anchoring. Now, we know that the coaching works uh, because we use a type of AI known as behavioral analytics. Uh, this is the same type of AI that uh, companies that sell you airline flights use when the prices go a little bit up and down, depending on how many people are offering uh, to buy a flight or buy a seat at the same time. Uh, these use fundamental studies in a revolution of human psychology uh, that are common um, to popular uh, psychology literature, if you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell or some of the books listed here, uh, that human, human perception is fundamentally irrational. Um, and this is the same uh, fundamental technology that drives viral, viral growth and allows social media companies to monetize content. So we just asked, why not take some of the, these insights and apply them to procurement, apply them to vendor negotiations? Um, and so the first time that BASF uh, did a negotiation for screws and fasteners, which is a real meat and potatoes, uh, MRO, maintenance, repair, and operations categories, they saved uh, over uh, close to $600,000 in under 60 minutes. Um, and this was not a category that they were able to negotiate previously because they had over 5,000 line items and eight vendors and it was very difficult to compare all of these line items because the vendors were all bidding on different parts. And so just the process of offering that price at the beginning and coaching the vendors through it uh, allowed them to negotiate this category for the first time. How? Because again, our perception is not rational. Uh, you may see these lines, uh, the bottom one is slightly longer. You've already maybe guessed that this is an optical illusion. Um, and so that's why our value prop is, is pretty simple. It's negotiations that run themselves for the most part. It's vendors with clear next steps. It's delighted teams scoring big wins on the procurement side of the table. 
And the reason is because so much of this today lives in long email chains and spreadsheets that are just fundamentally unpleasant. And this is why you need to apply AI to this, this kind of problem domain. So this all translates into big savings for the business. Um, and these, by the way, because of the way that reinforcement learning works, it improves over time. So the more negotiations you run, the more the system learns about your vendors, what motivates them, what influences them, what line items they're more susceptible to anchoring on and less. Um, and that translates into real business value. So the folks that have used this have said it's freaking awesome. Um, and it's also a really good way to manage risk. If you are worried about climate change, if you are worried about conflicts around the world, if you are worried about tariffs, if you are worried that something is going to change your supply chain, being able to run a sourcing event is the best way to resource, to move your supply base, and to adapt to a changing uh, global environment. So that's us, BitOps. We're vendor negotiations outside your inbox. Thanks for your time, and uh, have fun at the food. Thank you so much, Edmund. And thank you, all of you who stuck with us today. Uh, you know, please now head over to the other side of the space. We have uh, happy hour cocktails networking, hoping to get a chance to talk with a lot of you and definitely take some time to meet the incredible startups that are demoing over on that side of the building. Thanks again, and come back next time.